Welcome to AQA AS Physics 2019 Paper 1. As per usual, sorry that I can't show the paper on screen because unlike the other boards, AQA will copy strike me if I do that. Okay, 1.1. Deuterium contains one proton and one neutron. What's the specific charge? Specific charge is also known as charge to mass ratio. So that should tell you all you need to know. It is the charge of something divided by its mass. So if a deuterium nucleus is just this, just one proton and one neutron, then that means it has the charge of an electron. It's just positive. So 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs divided by, well, two lots of the mass of a nucleon. Yes, they are slightly different, but when it comes to this kind of question, we just go with the 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27. So only really when we go into nuclear with the A level do we then think about how they're slightly different. And that will give you to two sig figs, 4.8 times 10 to the 7 coulombs per kilogram. And even if you can't remember what specific charge is, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's in your formula sheet, but whatever, you're given the unit. And like I always say, units are your friends. So even if you can't remember how to do something, look at the units, see what they tell you. Coulombs per kilogram, that tells you that it's gonna be calculated with charge divided by mass. 1.2, what's the exchange particle of the strong force? Well, interesting one, depends who you ask. Some people say it's a pion, some people say it's a gluon, but we're only given one option here. So the answer is pion. But if you were just asked it and you were asked to write down the answer, you'd get the mark if you put pi on or glue on. 1.3, how does the variation of the strong nuclear force with distance contribute to stability of the nucleus? Well, first things first, let's write down what we know about the strong nuclear force. We know that the range is three to four femtometers, but then we have the extra thing that we say is attractive above 0 0.5 femtometers and repulsive below that. If you remember the graph, it looks something like this, where that's about three femtometers, and that there is 0 0.5. So we know it's attractive there and repulsive above. Okay, so how does this contribute to the stability? Well, it affects protons and neutrons, both nucleons, therefore prevents them moving closer and even further apart. Sorry, my writing isn't that good today. Tritium, ooh, we're going up one. So tritium is gonna be this, one proton, two neutrons, and that's H3. So which one of these could produce another element when it decays? Well, we know it can't be alpha because alpha is a helium nucleus ejected from a bigger nucleus. And of course, we don't have enough nucleons in the tritium in order for that to happen. Not enough nucleons in the nucleus. Okay, what about beta or beta then? Let's have a look. Let's actually write down the formula. So if we decay into something else, we are releasing a beta minus particle. Let's just call that an electron. Doesn't matter really. The mass is basically zero. The proton number is minus one. The atomic number is minus one because it has the opposite charge to a proton. So just finishing that off, that means that we've actually gone up. So yes. Technically, we could say that is valid. And of course, we know that in beta decay, a neutron turns into a proton and an electron. That's why the atomic number goes up by one, even though the mass stays the same. What about electron capture? We would have the tritium, but then we'd have an electron coming in with minus one atomic number. And so that would theoretically mean that it would have an atomic number of zero but we'd still have the same mass. And of course, well, that would just be three neutrons just stuck together then, wouldn't it? Can't happen. So we can say not valid as nucleus must contain at least one proton. There we go. Beta decay is the only one that can happen. 2.1, we have an EMF of 7.4 volts. We have no internal resistance, fine, so that's just a voltage. We don't really care about the EMF part. That's the PD that it supplies to this heating element. It has a resistance of 3.7 ohms. Always write down your data nice and neatly so you can see clearly what you have. Current is two amps and the time is 240 minutes, but 
we're going to turn that into seconds because we know we have to have it in seconds. So that is 14,400 seconds. Okay, we're being asked to find the energy dissipated. It seems like we're given quite a lot of data here. In fact, I think we've been given too much. So we know that, first of all, the energy, well, power is energy divided by time, rate of energy transferred. Therefore, energy is power times time. So we need an equation for power first. We already have a time. Power we know is equal to Vi or I squared R or V squared over R. So let's use P equals Vi. So therefore, we can say that energy is equal to V times I times T. So just V and T, VIT. So uh, the PD, the voltage, is that 7.4 times that by 2 times that by the 14,400 seconds. And it gives us 213,120 joules. Let's just have a look at our data. Everything was given to two significant figures. Well, it doesn't matter if everything was. Two sig figures is the lowest level of accuracy that we have with our data. That means that we have to give our answer to two sig figures two. So we're going to say 2.1 times 10 to the 5 joules. 2.2, length of the heating element is 0.85 meters. And we have a cross-sectional area and we have a resistivity. Some people say resistivity, but I say resistance, not resistance. So I like saying resistivity. So is the material, the carbon fiber tape, suitable? Well, what do we know that it has to be like up above Previously in the question, we know it has to have a resistance of 3.7 ohms, question mark. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get our equation, R is equal to rho L over A. So we're trying to find the resistance. So let's just pop that in. So 2 times 10 to the minus 5 times 0 0.85 divided by that cross-sectional area. Should we tidy up some powers of 10? I think we should, nice and easy. So we have minus 6 on the bottom. We're dividing by that. So that means the whole thing goes up by times 10 to the 6. So times 10 to the minus 5 on the top. And then if we have 6 on top of that, that means that we just end up with times 10 to the 1. So in other words, 20. So 20 times 0 0.85 divided by 4.9. And we should get an answer that's near. So we have 3.5 ohms to 2 sig figs. That's a little bit mean <laughs> because it's not that different, but different enough. So actually, well, the mark scheme isn't very helpful here either. It says, so long as you've calculated that or the appropriate length, and so long as you've given an appropriate conclusion. Well, what is the appropriate conclusion? We think AQA are hedging their bets. They don't even know. We're going to say close to 3.7 ohms. Therefore, okie dokie. But if you said no, because it's too different, you'd also get the mark. 2.3, we have this circuit. We have an LED, we have a resistor, R, and we have this heating element and then. And we have the IV characteristic graph for the LED. And uh, as per usual, it's zero until we reach that sort of threshold voltage. So we have current at the side here, and we have voltage or PD on the x-axis. Uh, we can see that it starts conducting at around 2.06. Is that going to be useful or not? Let's find out. The circuit is designed, so the PD is 2.2 volts when the switch is closed. Okay. Ah, so that wasn't that useful. Calculate the resistance of R. Okay. So what do we know already? We have... Wait a minute. So we know the voltage from the battery is 7.4 volts. So that means that we must have 7.4 volts across the LED and resistor as well. Okay, so actually this isn't useful, but we're told what the PD is across the LED, and that's 2.2 volts. So let's go from 2.2 volts up to here, and let's find out what the current is through the LED. All of electricity, folks, just comes down to V equals IR. It's just a big Sudoku puzzle. You just got to find out as much as you can about each individual component or the branches that you have or the whole circuit. In this case, we're just looking at the LED for the time being. We've been told a voltage and we have a graph so we can find out what the current is from the graph. And let's bang on 15 milliamps. So in other words, 15 times 10 to the minus three, I'm just going to call that 0 0.015 amps. Great. So we have a current. 
So that's our current going through the LED here. So what does that tell us then about the resistor? Well, because they're in line with each other, they're in series with each other, we must have the same current flowing through that resistor R as well. There we go. So we know the current flowing through it is 0.015 amps. We're looking for a resistance. So what else do we need? We of course need a voltage. How do we find out the voltage? Well, what do we know? Again, they're in series. The total PD across both the LED and resistor is 7.4 volts, but we know that 2.2 volts of that has been taken up by the LED. So that means there's just another 5.2 volts left for the resistor. So that's our PD, that's our voltage. So V equals IR, Ohm's law, rearranging this, resistance is equal to V over I. So that's 5.2 divided by 0.015, and that gives us 346.6 recurring, but we never write recurrence ever, ever, ever. So 347 ohms, but again, our data is given to a minimum of two sig figs, so that means we need to go to two sig figs to 350 ohms. Okay, we have this reverse bungee going on. Okay, it looks complicated. Uh, first things first, I'm gonna write down we have a height of 35 meters. I always say, if you're given a height, then you know that there's probably gonna be some energy conservation going on. Maybe, maybe not, but generally there is. Let's have a look though. So we're told that the tension in each rope is 3.7 times 10 to the four newtons. Okay, so that's a force. We know that's a force. I'm just gonna write F next to that because it's just worth remembering. Each rope makes an angle of 20 degrees. Fine, we can see that in the diagram. We have the tension as well there. Probably pulling the other way. It pulls in both directions, tension does. Okay, the total mass is 1.2 times 10 to the three kilograms. So that the force exerted by the clamp is about six times 10 to the four newtons. Okay. So what do we know? Well, we have the peeps inside their little thingamabob here, and we have the tension, uh, I am gonna draw it around that way. We have the tension in each rope pulling upwards, but the ball, the people aren't moving, so therefore there must be an equal and opposite force pulling downwards. I'm gonna call that F, I'm gonna get rid of that F there. Okay, so we know that the vertical components of the tensions must be balanced by this force from the clamp. But of course, I'm missing a force off here, aren't I? I'm missing the weight of the people and the capsule. Very important that we draw all forces before we start doing any calculations. Okay, so we know that the upwards forces equals the downwards forces because of course the capsule isn't moving or accelerating. So therefore we can say the force plus the weight is equal to two lots times the tension, but the vertical components, I'm gonna call that TV. So the vertical component of the tension. So of course we can find the weight from MG, can't we? But how do we find the vertical component of the tension? Let's just have a look at the diagram real quick. We have tension pulling upwards, we have 20 degrees, but of course that means that this is gonna be 20 degrees here because of just the way the universe works. And so we're going from T to vertical T, tell you what, let's write TV on there. And we have another one there, of course. How do we get this component then? Well, we want a smaller number, of course, because a component is always smaller than a resultant. So we're going to be timesing by, tell you what, let's just uh, put this here. So TV is equal to our resultant, 3.7 times 10 to the four. And then we're gonna be multiplying by, well, cos or sine of the angle. But is it cos or sine? But we are turning through the angle, that 20 degrees, so therefore, we're going to be using cos so times by cos 20. Where did I get that turn through the angle cos thing from? Well, it's from my easy vectors trick. It's brilliant. It helps you understand what you're calculating much better and it saves so much time. Lots of people go straight into just, oh, gotta draw a triangle if I'm finding components and resultants. It's much quicker if you just realize that actually all we have to do is either times or divide by cos or sine. My easy vectors trick, turn away from your sins, turn away from your sine, makes it easy to remember as well. Okay, so we can either do this all in one go uh, or we can do it one step at a time. I'm gonna do it all in one go. You can do it one step at a time if you want. So force is equal to two times this TV. So I'm gonna say two times 3.7 times into the four times cos 20. And then we need to take away our weight, which of course is uh, mass times G, which is mg. So that's just gonna be that 1.2 times 10 to the three 
times 9.81. And if you did this one step at a time, the force due to the tension would be 6.95 times 10 to the four, and the weight would be something like 1.18 times 10 to the four. So taking one away from the other, and we end up with 5.8 to two sig figs times 10 to the four newtons. There we go, got there in the end. Not an easy question, that one. Next, calculate the initial acceleration when the clamp is released. While we're looking for acceleration, we know that F is equal to ma. Simple equation, but we need to remember that this is total mass, and this is also total force, or resultant force. It's very easy to forget that. So let's get our peeps again. We know that the clamp has gone, so that force is now gone, but we still have the weight pulling down, which we still have mg pulling down. Uh, if I remember rightly, that was 1.18 times 10 to the four newtons. And of course we have the upwards force due to the tensions, the components. I'm just gonna call that TV. Yes, if we wanna find the resultant force, then it is gonna be one take away the other. So it does end up being just the same answer as before. The clamp was just countering that force, wasn't it? But it's worth remembering that because quite often questions are more complicated than that. Sometimes there'd be other forces involved as well. Anyway, there we go. So we're looking for acceleration. So acceleration is going to be equal to force divided by mass, just rearranging it. So that's going to be 5.8 times 10 to the 4 divided by the mass. What was that again? 1.2 times 10 to the 3. So in other words, that's actually just, again, powers of 10, 58 divided by 1.2. And that sounds like a fairly reasonable acceleration. We end up with 48 meters per second squared. Just a note on using values from previous questions which have show that. I think examiners are quite generous nowadays. If you use the value of 6 times 10 to the 4, I think you'd probably get the mark. But I always say that that show that it's about 6 times 10 to the 4 newtons, that's just there for your benefit for the previous question. Once you've calculated a value, that's of course what you use. Because you're not going to use an approximate value, are you? Of course, if you don't get anywhere near that 6 times 10 to the 4 in the previous question, then you can still obviously get 3.2 right by just using the rounded value that they've given. But as a rule of thumb, always use your calculated value. Okay, we have the unstretched length is 24 meters. Hooke's law, blah, blah, blah. We said the height was 35 meters, didn't we? Show the total elastic potential energy, because we know that elastic potential energy is equal to half fx or delta r or whatever takes your fancy but of course the force and the extension need to be in line with each other and so there's our 20 degrees there's our 35 meters and the unstretched length is 24 meters but we need to know how much further they've actually been stretched so we need to find first of all the total length of the ropes now so the length of the rope of course is longer than the 35 meters so we are again going to resolve but we're getting bigger this time so we're going to say the total length is equal to 35 divided by cos 20. And we're dividing because we want a bigger number and we're using cos because again, we are going through, we're turning through, sweeping through that 20 degree angle. And it gives us 37 meters. We should probably be a bit more accurate in our work and so 37.2 meters. Okay, therefore, what is the extension? Well, it's that 37. 2 take away 24 which is the original length and so we find that it has stretched 13.2 meters so we have our x okay so then all we have to do is say e is equal to half fx like we just wrote down so this is equal to a half times the force now we're not talking about the vertical force here are we because the force and the extension need to be in the same direction so we're just talking the 3.7 times 10 to the four newtons. Let me times that by the extension 13.2. But I think we're gonna to have to put a times two in there as well, because we're looking at both ropes, aren't we? Okay, so I think the half and the two are gonna cancel, so it's just gonna be 3.7 times 10 to the four times 13.2, and that does indeed give us, well, 4.88 times 10 to the five, so. Uh, let's do that to two sig figs. Let's say 4.9 times 10 to the 5 joules. Again, not a very easy question. The designer's claim it will reach 50 meters above Q. Is the claim justified? So we have our potential energy of 4.9 times 10 to the 5 joules. So we're looking for the height that it reaches. Does it reach that 50 meters? 
So there we go, I was right, we're given a height, we are going to have to do conservation of energy. The elastic potential energy is going to be equal to the GPE that it's being turned into. So therefore we can say MGH is equal to 4.9 times 10 to the 5. So therefore we're looking for a height, so therefore let's take M and G over the other side. Therefore the height is going to be equal to 4.9 times 10 to the 5 divided by the mass. What was that again? 1,200, so there we go. And again times that 9.81. In fact, I could have just got the weight from earlier, couldn't I? But there we go. So 4.9 times 10 to the 5 divided by 1,200 times G. And that gives us, oh, the carnies lied to us. It only goes to 42 meters. So that they are, so they are liars. Okay, so it says it reaches a speed of 90 kilometers per hour. Great. So we're just being asked to calculate the kinetic energy when it travels at that speed. So first things first, we need to turn that into meters per second. So that's 90,000. So that's nine times 10 to the four meters per hour. But then of course we know it's gonna be fewer meters per second. So we divide that by seconds in an hour. That's 3,600, useful number to have in your head. And that gives us 25 meters per second. Isn't that convenient? Therefore, kinetic energy is equal to half mv squared, so that's equal to a half, times the 1,200, which was the mass, times 25 squared. So in other words, just 600 times 25 squared. And that gives us two two sig figs, 3.8 times 10 to the 5 joules. So in 3.6, without further calculation, is the maximum speed claim justified? Well, we saw that the potential energy stored in the ropes was five times 10 to the five joules. So there's that much available. And so is it possible that 3.8 times 10 to the five of that is turned into kinetic energy? Yes. So we can say it's greater than the kinetic energy needed for that speed. Therefore, could be possible. It'd be nice to do a calculation really, wouldn't it? But we're not allowed to. Okay, 4.1, here's John Tyndall, and uh, we're given the refractive index of water as 1.33. First things first, why does it stay inside the stream of water? Well, it is total internal reflection, or TIR. And we're being asked to explain it, so light hits air water boundary. That's just right down the two conditions, basically, isn't it, for TIR? At angle greater than critical angle and as the refractive index of air is less than that of water, TIR occurs, no light refracts out. We've been asked to calculate the speed of the light in the water. So we know that refractive index tells you how much slower light is in the medium compared to air. So therefore, refractive index of water is equal to the speed of light in air compared to the speed of light in the medium. Therefore, swapping these two round, speed of light in the water is going to be equal to the speed of light in air, which is three. Well, mm, for a number of six figs, speed of light is three times 10 to the eight. But if we're going to a high degree of accuracy in our formula sheet, it's 3.00 times 10 to the eight. So we're going to use that divided by the 1.33. And it gives us two three sig figs, 2.26 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Next, we're being asked to find the critical angle. Let's write down Snell's law. I always like to start with Snell's law. N1 sine theta one is equal to N2 sine theta two. Yes, I know there's probably an equation in your formula sheet that gives it to you straight away, but I find it's always best to go from the beginning with this. It doesn't take long and it helps you understand things a little bit better. So we're talking about the critical angle for the water going into air. And then we know when we have an angle of incidence of theta one that's equal to the critical angle, then the light refracts along the boundary. So in other words, we have sine 90. So that means because the refractive index of air is one, that disappears, and sine of 90 is also one, so that also disappears. Therefore, refractive index of water times the sine of the critical angle is equal to one. Therefore, sine of the critical angle is equal to one over refractive index of water, so one over 1.33. So we're just going to do the inverse sine of 1 over 1.33, and that gives us 49 degrees. Here we have a step index optical fiber. We have x in the middle, and we have y around the outside. What are x and y? Apart from being a cold plate album, x is the core, 
light is transmitted through this. Of course, it's made of glass. And then we have Y is the cladding. And this has a lower refractive index. Should have just written N. Dope. Has a lower refractive index than X. So TIR can occur at the boundary. And then finally, we're just being asked to discuss the problems caused by material dispersion and modal dispersion. So material dispersion is due to different wavelengths of light having different refractive indexes or different indices, so different N. Overcome by using monochromatic light, just one wavelength, don't have that problem. And then modal dispersion is due to light taking multiple paths through fiber or core and therefore they arrive at different times this is overcome or mitigated that's a good word mitigated just means the effect is reduced mitigated by using thin core and repeaters or relays okay they monitor earthquakes so that means that the impurities move so that means the light reflects back off the impurities oh man okay Suggest why the amount of reflected light changes as the fiber bends. Uh, so I guess we say that light, I don't like this question. Light reaches impurities at different angles, therefore will encounter more impurities. So like they're implying that, so if it gets reflected back, then it's going to hit more impurities. Oh, I don't know. I don't like this question. The mark scheme says it might encounter different sizes of impurities, blah, blah, blah. Basically, the more it bends, the more difference there is between all of the light rays that are bouncing around. And it says you can draw on the diagram as well. Should we draw on the diagram? Yeah, let's have a look. If this is bent down a little bit, then it's possible that this is going to hit the impurity at an angle and then, like, get reflected back here. And then, who knows? <laughs> I give up with this question, sorry. 4.6, okay, nice and easy. Transverse and longitudinal. Transverse oscillations are perpendicular. Now, you might want to say perpendicular to the direction of the wave, but they like you to put perpendicular to direction of energy transfer. Don't ask why, just go with it. We all know what it means, the direction of the wave, because the wave goes from A to B, doesn't it? And then we have longitudinal. Oscillations are parallel to direction of energy transfer. 5.1 looks like a moment's question because we have multiple points, multiple forces going on. So we have this ruler. We have these hooky hooks. We have 12 centimeters there, 12 centimeters there. So therefore, why not? Let's do this as well. We have 100 take away 12, take away 12. So that is 76 centimeters in the middle there. Okay. What are we being asked? The ruler is uniform with 1.12. Let's draw that right in the middle. We know that that's going to be at the 50 centimeter mark as well. Determine the reading on A. Oh, well, they are the same distance away from the center of mass. So it's going to be equal for both. Well, that makes sense. It's a one mark question. Cool. So it's just going to be 1.12 divided by two. So 0. 5.6 newtons. Easy start. 5.2, student suggests that the forces act as a couple. Student is an idiot. No, as couple must consist of two coplanar forces acting. Uh, they also have to be equal, but they need to be acting in opposite directions. But these bad boys, they're in the same direction. So what is this guy talking about? 5.3, we're now adding a weight on here, W, and that's a distance D away from A, A into B. Okay, so what do these read now? This reads 0 0.82 newtons, and this reads 0 0.62 newtons. Okay, so we're being asked to determine W and D. Don't forget that when it comes to these questions, it's an equilibrium, so that means yes, the moments all have to be equal, but also the forces have to be all equal as well. And look, we've been given both forces pulling upwards. So that means the weight is gonna be equal to the 0 0.82 plus the 0 0.62 pulling upwards. Let's put a bracket around that, just so we say the upwards forces take away the 1.12 newtons pulling downwards. 
and it gives us 0.32 newtons. Nice and easy. Then we have to use moments to find out the distance. So which one are we going to take moments about? Doesn't matter which one, but let's go for A. So we know that we have the moment due to the weight, moment due to the ruler, and that has to be equal to the moment due to the meter at B. So let's build up our equations. So 0.32 times D, that's the moment due to the weight, plus, because we're dealing with clockwise moments here, aren't we? Plus 1.12 times, okay, how far is that away? Well, it's in the middle, so 50, but then take away the 12, that's gonna be 38. Let's put a bracket around that. And that's gonna be equal to the moment due to the other one, which is 0 0.62 times 76, because we already did that earlier. This is, if we do it one step at a time, 42.56. This is 47.12. Therefore, we can say that 0 0.32 times D is equal to that 47.12 take away, 42.56. That gives us 4.56. Therefore, D is equal to 4.56 divided by 0 0.32, and that gives us 14.25 centimeters, but I think we can do that to just two sig figs, so 14 centimeters. And we didn't need to change anything into meters because of course, it's all just relative, isn't it? These distances could be miles for all we care. 5.4, second student plagiarizes. The first student suspends the mass, same position. She moves the support A and B vertical. She moves the support to make A and B vertical. Does not make the ruler horizontal. Oh, okay, so basically just something like this. Whoopsie, should go over there. Yeah, I get asked this question quite a bit actually. Are they gonna be any different? No, they're not. Readings will not be different. Why? Well, weights haven't changed. Distances have, that is, when I say distances, I mean perpendicular to forces, that is. That's what moments is all about. Uh, so the distances have changed, but all relative to each other. We could say by same proportion. Because if you put something at an angle, let's say the distance on the left halves, it means that the distance on the right is halved as well. So it all comes out in the wash. State what is meant by an antiparticle. Particle with opposite charge, lepton, baryon, number, and strangeness, we should say, to its matter counterpart. Easy start, 6.2. Complete the table. Name of antiparticle. Well, well, it's just called an antiproton. But we don't call them anti-electrons. No, no, no. We call them positrons, don't we? Oh, too easy. 6.3. Particles in anti hydrogen can be made by pair production. Okay, the total minimum energy needs to produce one atom of anti hydrogen. Okay, so anti hydrogen is the same as hydrogen, it's just the opposite, so it's just one anti proton. So anti hydrogen, that sounds cool, doesn't it? So anti hydrogen is literally the same as just an anti proton. Ooh. Ah, it's not just the nucleus though, is it? We need to add on a positron. That's why they asked us about that earlier. So therefore, minimum energy is equal to the rest energy for both. And so that's equal to mc squared for the antiproton, p hat, plus mc squared for the positron. So I'll tell you what, we can just factorize this. So we can say c squared times mass of an antiproton which is exactly the same as the mass of a proton, isn't it? Plus the mass of a positron, which is the same as the mass of an electron. So there's gonna be three times 10 to the eight squared times 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 plus 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. Don't think the electron's going to make that big a difference. Never does usually, let's put it that way. And it gives us to, I think we could go to three sig figs here. 1.50, oh, it wasn't really worth it. Right, 1.50 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. The reason I say we can go to three sig figs is because in reality, this is 3.00 like we saw earlier. 6.4, line emission spectra, they've been compared. In terms of energy changes, how are line emission spectra produced? Well, it's because when electron or positron in an atom is excited, it is raised to a higher energy level. Should we put discrete in there? When it de-excites, 
and returns to ground state, it emits a photon. Now, people quite often, I often do this actually, you just say, oh, it emits a photon, but it's always best to go belts and braces. It emits a photon of energy equal to the difference in energy levels. And three marks, whenever you talk about electrons, the exciting line emission spectra, that kind of thing, it's always best to put the energy is equal to HF. Therefore, different frequencies and wavelengths are produced or emitted. I guess it's fair enough because we're not just being asked how a photons produced, we're being asked how a line emission spectra are produced. In other words, how are these different frequencies and wavelengths of photons produced? So there we go. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you want to see the other AS papers, then click on the card and it'll take you to the playlist. See you next time.